This Islamic scholar gets completely humiliated by these intelligent Christian women. Please watch, smash that like button because you're gonna enjoy this one. <laughs> can apply to someone who never dies. No, no, wait, wait. She can answer. Gone. Listen to the. Okay, once again. Someone who is immortal means someone who is not subject to death. Does either death or resurrection apply to an immortal being? I, I can't really explain the Trinity for you properly, I think. I didn't ask you to explain the Trinity. I'm just asking you to explain immortality here. Immortality means someone, a being who never dies. And to me, that is only God Almighty. Do you agree with that statement? Only God Almighty is immortal. No one else is. Do you agree? If somebody who claims to have died and then risen again, then they experience both death and resurrection, which does not. First of all, why are you limiting God? Second of all, we as Christians don't believe that God, his his like spirit or soul, whatever you want to call it, died on the cross. His godhood, his divinity didn't die on the cross. His flesh died on the cross. Because remember, Jesus is 100 percent man and 100 percent God. It's like, for example, when we as human beings, as common sense, whenever I die, is my soul actually dead when it goes to heaven or is it just my flesh that dies? Right. So it's the same concept with Jesus Christ. We know that like his divinity didn't die on the cross. It was just his flesh. So how does how does that go against him being able to be God? It just this is Muslim logic for you guys. Disingenuous to Kia. Not apply to God, which does not apply to an immortal being. Hence, I can conclude that Jesus cannot be God. But both death and resurrection, according to you, apply to him. Can I ask, what do you think? Who do you think Jesus is? I think he's a messenger of God, a prophet of God, and the Messiah. And what do you think happened to him? Uh, he's been ascended to heaven. Ascended. Yes. Okay. And he will come back. Second coming as a we believe that as well. But he is not God. The ultimate um, statement from Islam, which is the difference between the Muslims and the Christians, mainly this: that Jesus did not die on the cross. And Jesus is not God or the Son of God because that is blasphemous to God Almighty. He does not need a son. He does not procreate. We have in uh, chapter 112 of the Quran, Allah says, lam yalit wa lam yulat. He neither begets nor is he begotten. Because this is something which is against the nature of God to sire a child. And that's the reason the modern Bibles have removed the word begotten. Because the term begotten actually means to sire a child. God doesn't need that. He's not an animal or a human where he needs to procreate to extend his uh, progeny. He doesn't need that. He's someone who is independent of that. Did, did you say that you don't believe that Jesus died on the cross? Yeah, I don't believe that. Do Muslims don't believe that. that. Show me any eyewitness account. Go on. The... Name me a single eyewitness account. In the Bible. In, uh, no, who? who they all ran away. I it Again, this is a false comprehension of Jesus because whenever he's the only begotten son, that makes him God. Why? Because where does a cow come from? A cow. Where does a human come from? A human. Where does, uh, you know, so that's what, that's what I mean. Where does, a, where does a lizard come from? A lizard. So if he's the only begotten son of the father, what does that make him? That makes him God in the flesh. Gosh, this logic is just, it makes no sense, guys. This is Islam for you. According to your Bible, all the disciples ran away. They forsook him. They ran away? Yes. But they also wrote the... They forsook him. The, the people who wrote it were not the eyewitnesses. It's not to believe the historians. Which is story? Give me, a, give me a someone who's an eyewitness. That's why I asked you. Because we're going to look at Tacitus and Josephus. They were not eyewitnesses. They wrote... Decades after, or even centuries after. Okay, guys, I just want to say, first of all, that's the biggest cap, and he's committing to key a line right there. And even if you examine their, uh, what do you say, their manuscripts, what they're writing is, it was written much later on. It was something forged even to that extent. So look, even the Quran says that it appeared to them so. So I'm not saying that people did not believe it. People did believe that he was crucified. Yes? That's exactly what the Quran says. The Quran says he was neither killed nor crucified, but it appeared to them so. 
That means they, when the people saw this, they thought that it was Jesus who was being crucified. But I'm saying the, the Bible writers, the gospel writers, were not the eyewitnesses. And uh, Josephus and Tacitus and all these people who had claimed to have written about Jesus' crucifixion, they were not eyewitness accounts either. This is, and then the next verse says that Allah took him to himself, ascended, he ascended to Allah, and there's a lot of, and the people who argue about it are full of conjecture. They, they are in doubt about what they believe in as well. But anyway, like I said, God doesn't die. So we come back to that. Yeah, I was asking you the question. From the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, you said the Son died. Do you now agree that the Son is not co-equal with the Father and the Holy Spirit? Because one can die, the other two cannot. Yeah. Again, guys, he's making a false equivalence because no one is denying that Jesus died on the cross, that his flesh died, but his divinity, his godhood was still alive. It's just like, it's, and I gave us such a simple analogy. It's like literally our soul. When I die, like if someone shoots me across the head right now, let's say a Muslim, he commits, uh, you know, jihad or something. He shoots me across the head. Guess what's going to happen? My soul is still going to go to heaven. So did my soul die? No. It's a similar concept with Jesus Christ. Just because his flesh died on the cross doesn't mean that his divinity or godhood died as well on the cross. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So God was in the bush? No, we don't say God is in the bush. Okay. Why would you say God is in the bush? Did it say God is in the bush? Huh? It doesn't say that in the Quran. No, in the story of Moses, it doesn't say God is in the bush. What did he say in the bush then? He heard a voice from there. Okay. Okay. Let me ask you this. Have you spoken to your mom on the phone? Yeah. Yeah? Is your mom in the phone? When you speak to her? No. You hear the voice from there? Is she in there? So let's use logic. Come on, guys. God doesn't need to enter his creation to show his majesty. Okay? As soon as he does that, then he becomes a weakness. And God is not a weakness. He has to act like a man. He has to eat like a man, sleep like a man. You know, after you eat food, you have to go to the bathroom, sorry, the toilet to relieve yourself like a man. This is all against the nature of God. He's not a, he, he, does, he doesn't have weaknesses like the ability to die. And that too by his own creation. Think about it. His own creation killed this mighty God. It doesn't make sense. Why? To forgive you? Why don't you ask yourself this question? Why can't my God forgive me without killing an innocent man? Without this human sacrifice? Why is that not possible? He's saying that Allah is limited because he can don't be a human. It's the other way around. Your God is limited because he cannot forgive without becoming a man and dying by his own creation. That is a limitation. My God can forgive without coming to the world. Not be a human. No, but like I told you, you're talking about a God becoming a human, which means you're insisting God become weak. I'm saying the other way around. Does God, can God forgive without becoming a man? Yes. Bro, let them ask. Can he? What was the question? That can God forgive without becoming a man? I think he could do it, do, do it in another way, but he came like a man in flesh. No, no. Can he forgive? We, we but I'm asking. Sinners, and then he had to, to come as a man. Why? Take our... Why? Why is that necessary? Why can't God forgive you if he wants to? Yes? Instead of him becoming a man. I just want to create. I just want to mention this because he's clearly being disingenuous. So are you saying that God didn't forgive people in the Old Testament, bro? Clearly, God has forgiven people in the Old Testament. Why did Jesus have to come? Well, according to Jewish tradition, they had to use lamb to be brought to the slaughter that was without blemish. And Jesus was that ultimate sacrifice that we no longer have to use lambs to be brought to the slaughter, guys. I mean, this is common sense stuff, guys. Look at Jewish tradition. And he's planning to be dying like a man. Maybe the torture like a man. Way, Say again? Not, maybe he could do it another way, but that's what not the way he No, no. If you're, if you're talking about limitation, that's the reason I'm, I'm asking you this question. Why can't God forgive you without bloodshed? Can I say anything? Yeah, go on. Uh, so, um, when God came as a human, he yeah. showed us love. He showed us that he wants to be near us. He showed us yeah. Uh, How is that love? Killing a man who is innocent. How is that love? 
How is that even justice, let alone love? To me, killing an innocent man is neither love nor justice. To me, this is something which is against the nature of God. Second? He wasn't a man. He was God. Himself. Of course, he was man. That's the reason he could die. He came as a man. So don't say he wasn't a man. He was a man. He was God. Okay, if he was God, then the question again arises: How can God die? You can't have it both ways. Either you accept and acknowledge that he died like a man, or you say that he is a God who cannot die, because you can't have it both ways. It'll be contradiction. And the reason you end up with a contradiction is because your basis is a contradiction. When you say he's 100% God and 100% man, you know, logically, mathematically, it is something God which... Exists. God is not logically, it can't be explained logically or mathematically. What does God tell you? To love him with all your heart and with all your... Mind. And so on. Why mind? Why did God you say you have to use your mind? Guys, the Islamic view on things is so twisted. He literally asked this young girl like two minutes ago how is that love that he literally died on the cross for you bro that's literally the greatest expression of love he didn't have to he humbled himself in the likeness of man according to philippians chapter 2 that he came in the form of man while being god and the likeness of man while still being god guys that's literally the god we serve he loved us so much that he did that to be the ultimate sacrifice when he didn't have to be uh, logical. Yes, use logic, use your rationality, and use your intellect. Of course, so use your intellect. Don't say don't use logic when you're talking about God. You have to, because God himself tells you to use logic. But we are uh, body, soul, and uh, mind. Yeah, how many persons are you? One, but three. Yeah. No, no, you have three different natures. How many persons are you? Still one, right? Yeah. There you go. How many persons is you? How many persons is your God? The God? God is God. No, no, how many persons is your God? Bro, please. Come on. How many persons? It's three, right? So do not use the the example that you use is actually a Christian heresy. Yes? Sabellianism. Yes? You should not use that. Because what you're pointing to is something which is a heretical view amongst Christians. Those people who see God as only one person. In Christianity, just FYI, I'm saying, this is considered a heresy that the church has actually rejected. As a Christian, you have to believe in three persons as, of God if you're a Trinitarian. Unless you're a Unitarian, they believe in God to be one person. And that's the reason I asked you earlier, why do you believe that one person from the Trinity can die, the other two cannot? Because that is, your, the, the doctrine of Trinity teaches that they are co-equal in nature. If one person can die, the other two, that is not co-equal. This is so sad, guys. Like, this man is literally committing to Kia. He's literally lying to these poor Christians and telling them such a lie. So just because the Holy Spirit and the Father can't die does not mean <laughs> that you believe in a heresy, guys. Let me get that straight. Because, I mean, all the Muslims, like, you guys have to stop committing to Kia lying. Because that shows you're disingenuous. It shows that you're not actually seeking truth. You're just protecting vain and pagan tradition. Because the reality of the fact, guys, is that, yes, Jesus died. But that's only because he was reincarnated in the flesh. His divinity didn't die. The Father and the Holy Spirit, their divinity doesn't die. So that's the reason why it's such a terrible argument and example to use against the triune God of Scriptures. So you're opposing... Your view opposes what the doctrine of Trinity was established in the 4th century in Nicaea, Council of Nicaea. It took them 300 years to establish this, you know that. Why? Because it's not in the Bible. The, the concept of Trinity is not in the Bible. It is something which is derived later on by the Church Fathers. This is totally not true, guys. I mean, if you guys even just read Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, it says, For the fullness of a Godhead deity is in Christ Jesus. Also, when you look all throughout scripture, you see like in Luke chapter three, it says that the Holy Spirit descended as a dove upon Jesus and the Father was in heaven. So, I mean, we see the concept of the Trinity all throughout scripture. We even see in Genesis 126, for God said, let us make man in our image, referring to more than one while still being one God. And the reason why we know it's not a majestic us and our is because the majestic us and our wasn't used until 10, 12th century when the Bible was actually actually written thousands and thousands of years before the, the majestic 
usage of us and our. So we know it's referring to more than one while still yet being one. It's like three in one body wash. So he's just being completely disingenuous at this point, guys. And he's trying to see how far he can get in his lies to convince these Christians to convert to Islam. It's so sad and pathetic, guys. And that's the reason I'm telling you, you see, Islam is, is clear and it's perfect in the sense that when it teaches about God Almighty, all we need is one chapter, 112. Yes, which is only like four verses. And it tells you specifically who God is. That Allah is one, yes, that He is eternal, that He neither begets nor is He begotten, and there is none like Him. So beautiful, all encapsulated in one single chapter. And the entire Quran, we have a lot more information. But I'm saying for us, this itself is just sufficient. But you, as a Christian, you have to rely on the church 300 years after Jesus is gone. Even Jesus Himself never ever preached to you that you should worship triune God. In fact, forget Jesus. None of the prophets, none of the messengers in the entire Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, ever worship a triune God. Very false. We can actually see Thomas says, my Lord and my God to Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter one, verse eight, the father says, thy throne, O God, for a, a scepture of thy righteousness, thy kingdom, right? So we see the father God refers to Jesus as God. We also see Thomas refer to Jesus as God. We also see Jesus say the Holy Spirit will be given unto you guys. And we see the spirit of God within the very first chapter of the book of Genesis. I mean, so this concept of the Trinity not being found in scripture is completely false now the word trinity is not found but the biblical term for trinity the theological term is called trinity for the triune god but the biblical term is actually called the godhead so if you actually go to like things like the kjv bible they will use the word godhead to refer to the triune god so yes it is found in scripture the godhead that's what it's actually called biblically if you can show me an example from the bible please do, can I do? yeah go on okay. show me someone who worship a triune god I'd be very surprised if you do. Because this is a question I've asked many Christians. To show me an example from the Bible where somebody worshipped the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Can I say something from the Bible? It's uh, Matthew 3 and 16. It's from when Jesus was baptized. Yeah, it's about the Son. Yeah. Nothing to do with worshipping the triune God. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went to out of the water. At that moment heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Okay. Where does it say about worshipping a triune God? What you pointed to there about the baptism of Jesus is that you have these three different entities, God. the Father, yes. the Son, and the, and the Holy Spirit. Spirit. But does it ever say that these three are one, one being as God? Or does it even say that you should worship them? No, it doesn't. And that was my question. Why no one, you know, from all the people who love Jesus Christ, none of them worship a trinity. Jesus himself, when he was asked, how shall we pray? What was his response? You remember that passage, the Sermon on the Mount, and even the Lost Prayer? What is the Lost Prayer? How does it start? Come on, you guys say it in the church all the time. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Okay, so when it starts with our Father in heaven, why does it not say our Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in heaven? But the whole, you have to say the whole thing? No, no. I'm saying even in the whole in the whole prayer, it never says to say in the name of the Father, Son, or the Holy Spirit. None of that. So when Jesus was specifically and explicitly asked this question, he teaches them to only worship the Father, only pray to the Father, and prayer is a worship. Can I ask you a question now? Yeah, about how, go on. How you're saved or how you how Yeah, you of course. Paradise. Of course you can. Just, uh, not that you know it, but like, can I ask about it? Yes, of course. Um, is it what you do? If you do more good things no. than wrong, yeah. you go to paradise? Okay. Or so in, in order to answer your question, nobody enters paradise without the mercy of God. Right. So the first thing which comes... How do you get the mercy? Gosh, guys, he's literally such a liar. If anything, the Our Father in Heaven prayer, guys, literally proves that Jesus Christ is God. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Hmm, what is this kingdom coming? Maybe Jesus Christ. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. 
huh, what's our daily bread? I wonder if that's Jesus Christ. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Whoa, Jesus was sent for the forgiveness of our sins. Lead, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Whoa, the Holy Spirit, it gives us the power to not be led into temptation and be delivered from evil. I mean, literally, you see the triune God all throughout scripture, guys. I mean, this is just such a terrible argument and very disingenuous. Yeah, I'm coming to that. Yeah. So the first thing is no one by their own deeds or by their own works will go to paradise. It is by the mercy of God Almighty because that is the uppermost. You know, we commit so many sins in our lives. We do so many wrong things. We are not entitled to go to paradise, yes? Right. But it is with His mercy that we, Allah, enters us. And like I told you, the condition is obviously Iman, that you have to worship Allah, do not associate partners with Him, and do the will of God, okay? So the Muslims, we believe in the five pillars. The first pillar is what I just told you, to worship God uh, without any associating partners. The second is to pray five times a day, uh, to give charity, uh, to fast in the month of Ramadan and to go for Hajj. So these are the basic requirements for us, the fundamental... Those five yes, these are the fundamental basic requirements. The last one is, uh, is again conditional for people who can afford to go for Hajj uh, or they have, they have the health at least to be able to do that. Uh, so there, there are caveats to this as well. But what I'm saying is that we have the promise of paradise. And this Everyone, that all that the Muslims, yes, all the Muslims. But in you fact, have any assurance? If you, it? yes, in the, in fact, Allah promises paradise. That is the assurance. The promise is conditional. It's not unconditional. You know, like for example, if you go to any test that you give, it is conditional that you pass it. In order for you to pass it, you will get the certificate or whatever it but is. To pass it, you have to put in a lot of effort. No, not a lot of effort. The five times. The five daily prayers, okay, no. is not a lot of effort. We take like five to ten minutes for each prayer. But, it's not a lot of effort. Maybe for you it might be. For the Muslims who pray, it is it is very easy, and it only it also connects us spiritually on a daily basis. If you have five different what do you say points in your daily life where you remember God, and then you're free to do whatever you want, obviously in a halal way, in a, in a way which is uh, accepted by God, you're free to go work, study, spend time with your family, no problem. But just give this fraction of time from your daily life to God Almighty. Okay, and this is exactly what Jesus, you know Jesus, when he needed something, what did he do? What did he do in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was, when he was faced with the option of being crucified? What did he do? How did he pray? He prayed to God. How did he pray? What was the action he he performed. Your will be done. No, no, that is his, that's the words. I'm asking the action. What action did he do? He prostrated. He put his face on the ground and prayed to God. How many Christians have you seen do that? Many. I've seen. Have, do you do it? Yes, absolutely. Christians do that. What's your point? Just because we don't do it in public, li looking to seek for validation from man that we're holy, we don't get raisins on our forehead means that we don't do that come on bro get 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 serious dude come on dude yeah you know there's a difference between sometimes and every time because jesus whenever he did whenever he wanted something like he wanted to pray to god sincerely and with all his heart with all his um, focus on it he would do that and not only that moses did it abraham did it jesus did it and that's the reason I asked from all the prophets and all the messengers, why did none of them point to a trinity if that was so important for Christianity? If that is so important for your salvation, why did Jesus not tell you this? Why did the church fathers have to input this doctrine of the trinity 300 years after? Think about it. To be ready to meet him. No, no. Why did Jesus not teach you if it was so important? That is my question. Where? Well, show me the trinity in the Bible. Go on. That he will come, come back. No, that wasn't my question. My question is, if Jesus' teaching was so important and the Trinity is so important for your salvation, why did Jesus never mention it even once? No, you told me about the baptism. The baptism has got nothing to do with worshipping three gods. Sorry, three persons at one God. Yeah. Can I ask you about paradise? Yeah, go on. What is paradise? Do I keep this with you? Just like, what is, okay. 
Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. How do you define paradise? Yeah, no, no, no. What, what is it? No, I, I don't think it's very different from yours, but the only difference is you haven't been given as much information as the Muslims have about paradise. But even then, look, for us to be in paradise itself, we have to work for it. Okay? In addition to God's mercy, what is paradise? paradise is a place which is a place of reward for you. So God will give you the reward which you have never seen, never heard of, yes, never even imagined. So Allah will give you palaces of pearls, He'll give you uh, things that you have never even imagined. I don't know, I just heard, does it say in the Quran that when you go to paradise, one of the rewards you get as a man are yeah. women? Wives, not wives, only, wives, yeah. Men. Is, that, is there anything wrong with uh, marrying a woman if God gives it to you? He's such a liar, guys. He's talking about 72 virgin women, not 72 virgin wives or one wife. He's talking about 72 virgin women. It's so disingenuous, guys. It's literally adultery masked in marriage, guys. That's all it is. Because there are a lot of commit polygamy, but they're forced to get married. They don't even want to, guys. That's why if you guys look at most Muslim women, unfortunately, they, I mean, they after years of being married, they end up becoming like very obese and miserable. And the reason that is, is because their husbands don't want to do anything with them, guys. They have all these other women they'd rather be married to. It's the unfortunate, sad truth, guys. No, but I'm, I'm trying to say, what's your, is that an objection? Just, uh, I'm just wondering, I, I don't know too much about it, so I'm just no, no. asking. There must be something based on that question, isn't it? You must have a reason. You can't just ask it out of the blue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so is it, is it wrong if God gives you a wife or two wives or 70 wives? But can you treat them the same? It's paradise, lady. We don't know how, you know, you cannot compare this world to paradise. There, there, are, uh, there are hadiths we say that things like jealousy, things like envy, things like anxiety, things like um, uh, frustration, and all the things that you imagine in this world, you will not be plagued with any of this in paradise. Paradise is something which is a play of, place of bliss. Of course, in fact, meeting Allah and seeing Allah is the greatest gift of paradise. Everything else pales in front of that. For us, that is the biggest, the best gift. You are sure you will, you will end up. Everyone in paradise will see God. Oh, she asked me this question already. So I, I am not the judge. And, and like I told the lady, I'll give you the same answer. We don't know what state we are going to die at the end of our life. Okay. There was a Christian who used to tell us that we are all going to heaven. You are all going to hell. He was a born again Christian. He became a Muslim later on. So your, your guarantees of a human being is irrelevant. Even if you say, look, I'm not saying the Christians don't say this. The Christians say all this time, we are guaranteed heaven. Even though none of the passages in the Bible guarantees you that. And if you can show me, please do. None of the passages in the Bible guarantee you heaven. You it is faith, like a mustard seed. You're... That's so false. He's lying. There's so many passages that guarantee heaven. For example, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth should not perish but have everlasting life. Bam. I don't even have to think of anything else, guys. Your um, promise to go to heaven. That's in the hadith. Where is it in the Bible? It says in the Bible. Show me. Gone. All right. So, at the end of the day, what I'm saying is that worship of a triune God is not something that is advocated by any prophet, any messenger, not even Jesus Christ, not his apostles, not his disciples, none of them. In the Bible, you will not find this. It came 300 years after Jesus. What do you, what do you, what do you make of that? None of the people in the Bible ever advocated the worship of a triune God. So, so you're saying that no one can be sure to come to paradise? No, I'm saying when you talk about assurance, it means the day of judgment has already happened. So please wait for that opportunity. Don't jump the gun. You'll get your chance for God to, to be in the court of God. And then he's going to decide who is going to go to heaven, who is not. Okay, only so let's not jump the gun yet. Allah, Allah has promised us heaven, which is conditional. If you if you satisfy that condition, then you will be going to heaven. And the first condition of that is to worship God alone without associating partners, without uh, claiming that he has a son and so on. So I don't think the Christians have a very good track record of that. Because you do associate partners with God. 
the ticket to heaven is to believe in Jesus, what he has done. Say again? To believe in Jesus, what he has done for me on the cross. That's what, what I... That is yeah. what, Why don't you what, believe what Jesus himself said? When Jesus, when Jesus says in John 17, 3, that the only true God is the Father, why don't you believe in that? The only true God is one person, not three persons. He says the only true God is the Father. But, but please, leave the, the Trinity. That's so complicated to, to, uh, to really explain. Okay, can you go to heaven without believing in the Trinity? No. I can. No. Yes, I can. Well, then the Muslims are in a good place then. Alhamdulillah. I, I believe that. The Muslims are in a good place then. Look, we, we accept Jesus as the Messiah. We accept he's a prophet of God. We, we reject the Trinity like the way Jesus did. Yes? So we are in a better place than you. Okay. Alhamdulillah. That's your belief. No, no, but have I said anything wrong? Do, we, do the Muslims not believe in Jesus as a Christ? Do they not believe he's a prophet of God? Do they not believe he's a good man? Do they not reject the Trinity? So we, but in fact, are following the teachings of Jesus. For your sins. But that, okay, is that a necessity to go to paradise? Yeah, it is. Well, then you believe God... Then you believe God died. Yes, to me, to me that is blasphemous. I, yeah, to me I that is blasphemous. I, because I believe he's God, <laughs> but he's also one of the persons in the Trinity. And I can't, if you ask me, explain that. Can God die? Uh, he can. That was what you asked. Yes, exactly. You cannot contradict. You cannot contradict the Bible. Because I mean, the Bible says God doesn't die. Sometimes you have to, to see what. I mean, you have to compare. Compare what? Compare several verses. From the New Testament okay. And the Old I'll tell you what. You look at any verse in the entire Bible, not just the New Testament, also the Old Testament, and show me where it says God can die. No, I, I can show you where God says He cannot die. Or he no. does not die. I, I, I looked it up. You were right. It's so there you go. So why why are you but saying that belief in his death God, is necessary? If God, uh, he came as a man. Who came as a man? Uh, God in the person of Jesus. Where does it say that Jesus is God in the Bible? Where does it say? That he's a God. He, he, he is God. Again, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8. He's just trying to take advantage of the fact that obviously these Christians aren't the most well-versed on the word of God. Thy throne, O God, literally the Father says. That's where it says Jesus is God. So disingenuous, he's lying. Where does it say that? You're making a claim. You need to back it up from your Bible. You see what I mean? At least, look, the Muslims, when we make a claim, we back it up from the Bible. When I say something from the Bible... I make sure that I substantiate it from the Bible as well. I admit I am maybe not as good prepared as I should be. But it doesn't uh, take away my belief. Actually, your belief is not based on the Bible. Your belief is... No, no, I'm telling you right now. Your belief is based on emotions, not, not the Bible. And I don't want you to be offended by that because the reason you cannot substantiate the claims that you're making, that Jesus is God, that in order for you... To believe in his death and resurrection is the only guarantee like, for paradise. No, no, I don't want you to show me the chapter and verse. Just paraphrase it for me. I don't want you because I don't expect you no, to I'm, know every verse in the Bible or to know every passage. Just paraphrase it, you know, yeah. because these things are important. If you are guaranteed paradise, then you will know where the passage is. If you are saying that God will not reject you if you believe X, Y, and Z, then you will at least know. What God talked about and where he talked about. If we believe in faith in Jesus, we can have assurance that we will come to heaven. Yeah, Muslims believe in Jesus. So like I said, the Muslims are in a better place all the time. We're not believing the same Jesus. Exactly. Jesus didn't die on the cross. Yeah, my Jesus doesn't call people dogs. My Jesus is not someone who is cursed. Well, so you're talking about how your Muhammad was a PDF file and you think that's okay? All right. In the Bible, and that is another addition which I saw in the Bible. You know, it says in uh, 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 Galatians, it says in Galatians three thirteen that he became a curse for you. I'm sorry, uh, I have to leave. But no, thank you for no your problem. Yeah. But anyway, I would like to give you guys a gift of the Quran if you guys want to. It. It's free of charge. Come on, have an open mind. You know, I read the Bible. The reason you can do it, read the Quran. I can take it. Yeah, sure, no problem. There you go. If you guys want, Thank you for I'll give you. Thank yeah. you. No problem. Thanks a lot, guys. All right, and see you again, hopefully. Where are you guys from? Norway? Yeah. Okay. Just passing by, or you came to Speaker's Corner? We're students. Students. Very good, yeah. I hope you guys learned.
So as you guys can see, this Muslim feels very good about, um, you know, lying to these uh, poor, uneducated Christians. And I'm not saying that in a way to put them down, but he clearly knows how to choose his opponents well. Usually what these Muslim uh, scholars will like to do is they'll either choose women or they'll choose uh, people who are uneducated or disabled or have some kind of learning disability. Basically, people are who are at some kind of disadvantage emotionally, mentally, academically, intellectually, physically, whatever. And they'll use that against them because, you know, Muslims are very, um, unfortunately, they like to assert their dominance in a very abusive way. I mean, because this is what they're taught by their false prophet Muhammad. So, I mean, it's nothing that shouldn't be expected, but I just tell you guys this because it's a common theme. You'll see uh, other uh, Islamic apologists do the same thing like this. So, I mean, it's nothing new, but it's just so sad, guys. It's so sad because you could tell they're being disingenuous. They're not trying to seek the truth. But yeah, let me know uh, what you guys think about this in the comments below. Do you guys think he made good points or do you guys think I refuted all his points pretty good? Please go ahead and subscribe, turn on notifications, smash that like button. And um, if you can financially support me, because I really do need that right now. And yeah, I hope you guys enjoy. God bless you guys.